The paranormal has always been a source of inspiration for many writers, filmmakers, really artists of any trade. However, one thing that is always difficult to deal with when you're telling a story using paranormal elements is the fact that there are still a lot of unknowns within our own universe. It's our nature as humans to want to have an answer for everything, which is why more of the mediocre horror films devote a lot of time establishing an elaborate cosmology for a universe that we only really get to visit for about two hours, unless you have sequels on the way. Only a few films manage to balance between what we need to know for the sake of story and what has to remain a mystery for the sake of horror, and it is one such film we will be taking a look at today. And yes, we will be taking a look at them in high definition in today's episode of Monster Clash. Representing the old, we have the 1982 film Poltergeist directed by Toby Hooper and produced by Steven Spielberg. Representing the new, we have the 2015 remake directed by Gil Keenan and produced by Sam Raimi. Why am I making it a point to mention the producers in addition to the directors this time around? Well, because of the involvement or lack thereof of the producers is a major underlying difference of both films, and that is something I will elaborate on later in the episode. And I also want to make it known for the record that I am going off of the theatrical version of the remake rather than the extended cut, and the reasons are twofold. Firstly, the original only had a theatrical cut, so it makes sense to compare the two versions that audiences got to see in theaters. Secondly, I've become increasingly wary of an extended cut as opposed to a director's cut. See, a director's cut of a film implies that it's closer to the original vision of the film's director, whereas, at least in recent history, extended cuts tend to be drummed up by other editors hired by the studio in order to bolster DVD sales. As such, I've become increasingly wary of the term extended cut as opposed to a director's cut. With all of that out of the way, let us begin with round one. Like Carrie and many of the other films I've looked at on the show, the plots are fairly identical. However, the devil is in the details. In the case of the original, we are introduced to a world of prosperity and complacency as we are shown an idyllic family in an idyllic home in an idyllic neighborhood. It's the American dream fully personified and realized. Then, as things begin to get weird in the household, we see that illusion of prosperity shatter and dissolve. At first it's seen as a game or a simple quirk until the reality of the situation begins to set in and begins destroying their lives, coming to a head when the youngest daughter, Carol Ann, is pulled into the astral plane. Then the film begins focusing on the parents' struggle to rescue their daughter from whatever unknown forces are holding her prisoner, forces that none of the characters ever truly understand, not even the ones that are brought in to investigate. One major triumph of the story is how the hubris and complacency of the main characters almost undoes everything by the film's end. The medium and the investigators think they've won and go home, only for the entity dwelling within the house to attempt an all-out assault right as the parents let their guard down. But the coup de grace lies in the film's underlying criticism of the greed and affluence that the 80s have more or less become known for, as we learn that the real estate firm that Steve, the father, worked for built the residential community on top of what was once a cemetery. Not an ancient Indian burial ground, as many of the parodies would have you believe, but a regular cemetery that was in use for the past few centuries. Only when the malevolent entity dwelling within the house attempts to exact its vengeance, it is revealed that the company moved only the headstones from the cemetery, but not the bodies themselves, thus explaining the many weird manifestations that have been plaguing the family for the course of the entire film. Not only does this paint a picture of greed, but it also underlies the sense of betrayal felt by a man who almost lost his family because of his employer's greed, and the sense of guilt from the fact that it was something that he himself participated in and exacerbated. He and his wife moved heaven and earth to save their children from something that he essentially caused. As for the overall tone of the movie, it strikes an interesting balance between horror, suspense, and comedy, as the kind of things that both foreshadow events in the film and immediately follow the main story are presented in a matter-of-fact light. This isn't a film that's out to be funny from the outset, but rather creates its humor from the realistic reactions of the characters involved. When it comes to the remake, I feel that there were a lot of missed opportunities, as well as a lot of things that were lost in translation. The immediate issue is how the film tries to set itself in the version of America people were living in prior to its release, and that is by trying to tie aspects of the story to the after effects of the economic recession. While a noble intention, it doesn't do it in a way that really works to the film's advantage. Instead of a father who's enjoying the fruits of years of labor, we instead have a father who was recently laid off and is in denial about his situation. 
While that character in and of itself could work in a story like Poltergeist, it's a concept that's at odds with elements that are pulled from the original, chiefly the building of houses over a cemetery. What was once a twist of the spectral knife for the father is treated as an afterthought in this version, not to mention that we never see the bodies or the illusion of affluence crumble. What we got instead was a different focus for the story. While the original focused on what a parent was willing to do for their child, here we instead get one about redemption for a mistake made by one of the children, Griffin, who feels guilty for leaving his sister behind and running away. However, it's with the handling of his character, a boy dealing with post-traumatic stress that has caused many childhood fears to linger into an older age where they normally dissipate, that the story begins to fall apart. You have someone who's afraid of the dark and is easily startled, and the parents place him in the scariest part of the house that is also, by all accounts, the most secluded and the most dangerous. While it's understandable that they maybe hope that he gets over it, this lack of logic in simply having him sleep in the attic is baffling and feels more like a band-aid used to cover a plot hole rather than anything a logical parent might do or even what a stressed out parent might do. On top of that, with all of the work they do in creating this redemption story, it never really serves as the main focus, rendering the effort wasted. Had Griffin as a character taken more of a central role, maybe as someone who tries to convince the people around them that something is going on, only for them to listen when it's too late, then it would make sense. But here, like many of the original ideas introduced, feel like parts of a more unique early draft made to conform to the template of the original. When it comes to the stories of the two films, it feels like all the layers and all of the depth and all the commentary that were present in the original were simply stripped away in favor of a more generic version of the story that is so sanitized that it's more focused on carrying you from jump scare to jump scare rather than letting you get invested in the emotional drama. The clearest distinction is how much each film explores the emotional toll. The original devotes a number of scenes to the characters talking about it in hushed whispers as they wait for any sign of Carol Ann, not to mention that the parapsychologist goes out of her way to instill hope in Diane that they will save her daughter. You only get this briefly in the remake, and even then, we brush over it so quickly that it just feels more like a predictable story beat than a genuine exploration of drama. Instead, this film decides to devote more of its time to forced humor and divorcee drama. To me, it appears to be a classic case of a remake taking the core plot lines and the basic ideas from the original without understanding the depth or the subtext that made those original ideas work. As such, it feels more like it's based on a parody of Poltergeist rather than the film itself. As such, this round ends in favor of the old. One thing that I can say now that I've seen both films is that Poltergeist is more of a supernatural visual effects spectacle film rather than just a straightforward horror film, and a lot of the appeal comes from the visual effects that were used to bring these horrors to life. As such, let us begin round two. This is another case of one film besting the other simply due to how the opposing film falters. However, while this could be chalked up to the ongoing debate of the use of computer-generated imagery versus practical effects, I think the failings and the triumphs go a little bit deeper than that. The first thing the original film tries to do is to get you to let your guard down. It does this by painting a picture of classic suburban life with all of the various mundane mishaps that are bound to occur. As a result, you get a glimpse of what their lives are like before the story actually starts. This is something that's missing in the remake because we come into the story right as a bunch of changes have already taken place for the family. While that type of beginning isn't really a bad thing in and of itself, we never really get to see the characters and by extension the audience settle down into a false sense of security. As for the moments of horror, the original takes its time to build up to the scares, using that time to invoke a sense of wonder and awe. That's why the mother isn't immediately afraid of what's going on. It's a paranormal phenomenon that she hasn't experienced before and is excited by the prospect of something mystical and new happening in her life. Given the character we are made to focus on in the remake, we never really get that. This is primarily due to the fact that the film is in such a rush to recreate iconic moments from the original that it doesn't care to build up this sense of mystery. It wants to rush right into the scares, which leaves all of the moments of build up feeling predictable. Another problem I had with the remake was how it decided to over-embellish a lot of its effects when more simple executions would have done the job. We get it, you can do cool things with CGI, but you don't have to stretch out your effects shots to show that. This is chiefly seen in how the film goes out of its way to show off the astral plane, once again taking away that sense of mystery. In the original, we never see the inside of the astral plane because it wasn't necessary to the point of the story, as it's about people dealing with forces they don't understand or can even see. That's what makes moments like the medium coaching them and 
guiding Carol Ann so suspenseful because we never see what's happening. Here, it suffers the problem of trying to give answers where none were really needed, just so they could show off the fancy visual effects. However, there is one thing that isn't shown in the remake that is shown in the original, and that is the bodies that are buried underneath the residential complex. In the original, it was a grand final revelation that showed the audience what the cause of all the disturbances was. The fact that they moved the headstones, but not the bodies. The way they shoot out from the ground is indicative of the malevolent entity within the house tormenting them and making a last violent effort to trap them. This forces the sins of those responsible into the public eye. With the remake, we are simply told, but not shown. In fact, the film goes out of its way to give this film the happiest ending possible. Not only do we never see the bodies, but the medium who decides to sacrifice himself to save everyone gets to come back and live happily, rendering the entire moment pointless. Much like how the remake stripped away the subtext that was present in the original, it also stripped away a lot of the atmospheric buildup in favor of really fast-paced scares that are bolstered mostly by CGI. Now, I know a lot of people think today's audiences have really short attention spans, but it's okay to still have some questions unanswered, and most importantly, it's okay to take your time. As such, this round ends in favor of the old. I have to be honest, I racked my brain trying to come up with an idea for a third round for this episode, but given the tally and where it stands, is there really any point? I mean... It's clear that the original is the superior film, even if you're just looking at the tally. And what things I liked about the remake couldn't outweigh the monumental amount of problems this film has. And what problems I had with the original were benign by comparison. Honestly, it's a night and day difference, and part of that can be attributed to how involved the producers were in their respective films. It's a matter of public record how involved Spielberg was with this film. Not only did he write the story and work on the screenplay, but he was on set for almost every day of shooting. So much so that the Directors Guild of America had to conduct an investigation to see if Hooper had really directed the film at all. That's why the film has that Spielberg touch and why it doesn't really feel like a horror film at first. Contrast this with how the remake was most likely produced. I don't know how involved the producers like Sam Raimi were in the production, but it's clear they took more of a hands-off approach. While that is all well and good, this leads to the film feeling almost like it was churned out from a factory rather than as a real product of genuine inspiration. That's why the beats and jump scares feel so predictable, and that's why the characters feel so bland. That sense of wonder and amazement that was part of the original's production is gone in favor of the kind of generic, uninspired cinema that expects to be carried to success by the brand recognition alone. When people talk about hollow, boring remakes that don't get what made the original good, nor do they really care to, this is the kind of film most people are talking about. Given that the first two rounds went to the original, it's pretty clear which is the superior film. And unlike Fright Night, this remake just didn't have anything that I could give to it in even a pity round. As such, this clash ends in favor of the old. <sighs> I have to say, dear viewer, I'm incredibly disappointed by this clash. I mean, it's one thing to compare a bad movie to a good movie, or even two good movies to one another, but when you're having to analyze what is basically a very boring, bland, mediocre film it gets a lot harder since you're not given as much to work with. And honestly, the biggest missed opportunity of the remake was the chance to actually comment on what has transpired since the 2008 recession. I mean, you have the various bailouts and scandals, you have the various get-rich-quick schemes that cropped up everywhere. You could even draw some parallels to the nebulous motivation of the Occupy movement. But instead, this film chose to go the safe and easy route rather than use the medium that is horror cinema to actually comment on the issues of today. Kind of like what the original Poltergeist did back in 1982. Horror, and by extension the creation of fiction, has always been a way to reflect on the issues the creator sees with certain facets of the world they live in. Whether it's questioning if science has any place tampering in God's domain, forces of nature from the past coming back to terrorize the civilized world, or even the blending of fact and fiction resulting in people being forced to face the darkness either within themselves, or even the breakdown of society as a whole. Sometimes it's even as simple as a tragic occurrence, like godlike powers falling into the wrong hands. That is why horror cinema is still around and why it will never, ever go away. It holds a mirror to our world and allows us to confront the darkness within ourselves and our society in a safe, enjoyable way without any of the potential ramifications. If you want to do this right and actually do an actual exploration of our world through the medium that is horror cinema, you can't take the safe and easy route. On that note, 
This episode and Monster Clash 2016 must now draw to a close. Here's to the hope that you all have a safe and happy Halloween, but for now, dear viewer, I bid thee good night.